All right, the other two specific areas. So each one, each of the cortexes have areas in which uh, the uh, brain operates and also um, uh, processes information. And so the auditory cortex, as you can imagine, uh, is uh, clearly connected to uh, our hearing functions. And the thing, I, like I said, the thing I want you to pay attention to is the fact that each of these cortexes, outside of maybe the, the parietal lobe um, and some of the uh, motor and sensory cortex, are very much by the areas in which uh, they operate. So the auditory co cortex is in close proximity to the, um, to the ears where, uh, where all the hearing is done. And so the, the interesting thing about it is, is because the auditory cortex is on the, in the left hemisphere, what that means, if you remember clearly, is that there has to be a connection to the, the uh, right ear to get to the left cortex. Um, and so the hemispheres are specialized in their, in their nature, and there's, the um, auditory area has to basically move a little farther from the right to the left to get to that area. But at the same time, um, the, the um, fire together, wire together um, uh, principle is, uh, is completely uh, present when we talk about the auditory um, cortex. The other, the other one, obviously, and we talked a little bit about it as well, is the uh, visual cortex. And the visual cortex is interesting, like I pointed out earlier, uh, because it is so far away from uh, the area in which all the, the activity is going on. So we look at this and then think about the fact that it's taking, getting information from the eyes itself. Uh, the interesting thing about the visual cortex is that it actually follows two different pathways. There's not only the optic nerve, that is part of the, the processing of visual information. But there is also what some would call a more uh, ancient um, development of processing information that actually goes through the brainstem. And um, in one instance, in, in a video you might uh, be sure to take a look at, is, is the, something called blindsight. And, <clears throat> the, the hypothesis is, is that in spite of the fact that there's damage in the occipital lobe here, uh, that the, the person still is able to quote unquote see, uh, but they don't have a sense of seeing. Um, and it creates an interesting question for researchers to look at and we'll talk about that a little bit later when we talk about states of consciousness. One of the unique features of uh, humans, besides other things, is really lies in uh, the nature of our brain and how developed it is. Uh, the key thing, which this diagram makes very clear, is just how dramatic it is to move from lower uh, species of rats um, to cats, to chimpanzees, which were now in the primates, to humans. And the dramatic nature of what you see is you see very little association area in rats. Um, and the thing to keep in mind is the less association area uh, in whatever the organism is you're looking at, uh, the more governed they are oftentimes by instincts. And the less uh, flexible they are in their approach to problem solving. And essentially that's, uh, that is, uh, I guess I should stop talking and just write, right? Uh, in problem solving. And that really is part of what makes us as adaptable as we are. Um, so less association area, 
we were more governed by instincts, less flexible, uh, flexible, sorry about that, as more and less flexible. Um, the increase in association area, uh, and so greater association area by, by definition, if you will, allows uh, the uh, greater levels of flexibility and adaptability. And so you have greater flexibility and uh, adaptability. And you see that even amongst uh, primates, ability, and but the dramatic nature, if you will, of this difference is partly in, it's responsible for what makes us so dramatically different. Um, you can see the amount of uh, association area in a primate's brain, and then you move up to humans, and our heads, just by uh, design, are actually bigger, and they lead to higher mental functioning. Um, when, when you see, for example, primates uh, learning a language, they still have um, uh, have a ceiling to how much they can actually learn. And a lot of this uh, is directly impacted and response or uh, caused by the association area uh, because there's less associations to be made and our brain has an incredible capacity to create these associations that makes it so very unique. The, the other aspect of that, it, to, to just highlight for you real quickly, is, is the question, so what happens um, when damage occurs uh, in one of these areas? And your, your book highlights a few of them. So for example, in frontal lobe damage, um, it can alter the personality, it can lessen or remove, uh, uh, lessen or remove uh, inhibitions. Uh, I had a dentist when I was a kid who had a tumor in his frontal lobe, had it removed, and as a result, uh, because of the tumor's growth, had uh, destroyed parts of the frontal lobe. He could still do his job, uh, but uh, his personality was changed dramatically, and uh, most people in the um, uh, in my town uh, often talked about how much he had changed. Um, and I would also have you be sure to look at the case of Phineas Gage. Uh, his skull is probably one of the more uh, um, remarkable ones that is still in, I believe, in the Smithsonian. Um, but you see the hole in his head from a rod penetrating through his eye a socket and through the back of his head because of an explosion, and and his workers basically said that uh, he he wasn't the same guy. It's no longer Gage is what they referred to it as. So anyway, uh, that is a key component of uh, association areas in the brain and just how significant they are. Damage, like I said before, oftentimes help uh, helps us to understand actually how it operates.